As we draw our minds into the study of the night, we're going to be talking about the mark of being on fire for the Lord. And you might have heard this terminology used before. This, this term has been adopted by a lot of our uh, religious circles in today's culture. Maybe some of our brethren you've heard, heard use this term. Or you've heard this term in other places. In fact, there was a song we used to listen to. It would come on the radio growing up. It would say, Till I am a soul on fire. And my mother's in the crowd today, and she did not like that song. <laughs> She, I guess, didn't like the imagery of a soul burning or a soul being on fire, but what we're talking about tonight has no negative connotation at all. What we're talking about tonight is being on fire for the Lord. And it's a powerful thing. It's not only something that we need to seek to be, but it's something that's expected of us. And I believe this concept is based in Scripture and I believe this concept is something that we need to seriously consider in our own lives. Let's look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, Paul is writing about these marks of a true Christian. He's writing about these attributes and characteristics that make up a Christian that is authentic. These things that Christians ought to be to their core. And he says, starting here in verse number 10, he says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. Verse 11, Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. He says here, starting in verse 11, Not lagging in diligence. This word lagging means to fall behind. And this word diligence means to make haste. And some translations, in fact, say not lagging in zeal meaning passion. But to truly understand what this phrase means, we have to read into the parallelism of this passage because the following phrase says the exact opposite of what the first phrase is. And so in order to understand the first phrase, we have to understand what the second phrase means. He goes on to say, be fervent in spirit. Not lagging in diligence, but fervent in spirit. Let's talk about this word fervent for a second. In the Greek, 2204, it's zeo. It means to be hot or to boil. He's talking about extreme heat. This word carries the idea with it of extreme heat, such as fire. And he talks about the spirit. That is the inward man, often referred to as the heart. We're talking about some sort of extreme heat that we find in our hearts not lagging in diligence, but fervent in spirit. And David uses similar terminology in uh, the 39th Psalm. We see in verses 3 through 4, David said, My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue, Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am. Now in this context, David was grieving. And he wanted to know what the life to come was about. In that, he described this emotion as being hot in his heart. And that's the kind of emotion that we're talking about tonight when it comes to being fervent in spirit, when it comes to being on fire. But what's the point? In Romans 12, Paul told us the point. He concluded in what we know as verse 11 by saying, serving the Lord. We need to be fervent in spirit, brethren. We need to have our hearts on fire for no other reason than serving the Lord our God. As we consider this idea of our hearts being on fire, I want to draw to your attention the very first verse of Romans chapter 12. How Paul introduced this idea of these marks of a true Christian. Romans chapter 12, verse number 1, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. He calls us to be a living sacrifice unto God. What does that mean? Everything that comes from our body ought to give glory to God, ought to be presented to God as a sacrifice. What comes from our bodies? All the things we do, all the decisions we make, all the words that we say, 
All the thoughts that we think. Everything about us ought to be offered up as a sacrifice to our Lord. That is how we ought to live our lives. And that's the point Paul was trying to make very early on before he started talking about the marks of a true Christian. He goes on to say, being wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Let's talk about this word reasonable. In the Greek, it is logikos, is the word used there. It means logical. He says, it is only logical that everything about you ought to be offered as a sacrifice to the Lord. Why is that logical? Why do we need to give our everything to our Savior? Because He gave so much for us. And that's what ought to drive our passion. That's what ought to drive our zeal. Us being fervent in spirit starts with the passion that Jesus Christ had upon that cross. And that ought to encourage us to be willing to give Him our lives and give Him our hearts. To set our hearts on fire for the Lord. As we consider this scale, I want us to think about our own lives and our own hearts throughout the study tonight, and I will with you. Let's do some self-examination together as we consider the temperature of our hearts tonight, whether we are hot or cold for the Lord. We have an example of someone who is fervent in spirit we see in Acts chapter 18 by the, uh, by the name of Apollos. Look at Acts chapter 18, starting in verse 24. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. There was this man named Apollos. He was a Jew. And this describes him as being an eloquent man. Now we don't use that term very often to describe the man, especially here in Texas. We don't say, that is an eloquent man. He is quite eloquent. We don't say that very often. It's not normal for us. But the word here means well-versed. And he goes on to say this man was mighty in the Scriptures. Look at verse 25. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. Have you ever been instructed in the way of the Lord? Every one of us at some point in our lives have been instructed in the way of the Lord. At one point, we had the Gospel preached to us. And how did we respond to that Gospel? in obedience. And we became fervent in spirit for serving the Lord, didn't we? Look at how Apollos responded to being instructed in the way of the Lord by being fervent in spirit. Verse 25, this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord though he only knew the baptism of John. This man heard the way of the Lord. This man was taught something. And that made him hot on the inside. It made him boil. So much so that he wanted to teach other people the way of the Lord. But this says he only knew the baptism of John. Acts chapter 18, verse 26 says, So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him, the way of God more accurately. This man had responded in being taught the way of the Lord by being fervent in spirit and wanting to teach everyone. Do you remember the feeling and the emotions that you felt when you first came up out of that water to walk in newness of life? Do you remember the joy, the excitement, the relief, the fulfillment? This is the kind of feelings that causes us to be fervent in spirit. And early on in our Christian walk, we were on fire for the Lord, weren't we? We wanted to teach everyone about Jesus. We wanted to do good works. We wanted to serve the Lord. And that's what Apollos was doing. But it said he did not... He only knew the baptism of John. And Aquila and Priscilla heard him speaking boldly in the synagogue... He didn't have the latest update, so to speak. And so they took him aside and they taught him the way of the Lord more accurately. Oftentimes what happens when we are on fire for the Lord is we are burning hot 
And we want to do the work of the church. And we want to serve the Lord. And then we begin to grow cold. Maybe it's a few weeks later. Maybe it's a few months later. We begin to grow cold. Because things happen in life that discourage us. Have you ever went and taught someone something or you were in a study with someone early on in your Christian walk and someone had to correct you? We don't like the feeling of being corrected. But how did Apollos respond to Aquila and Priscilla taking him aside and teaching him the word of the Lord more accurately? Verse 27, And when he desired to cross to Achaia, he arrived. He greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the Scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Sometimes we can get discouraged because of certain things. And if you're a new Christian here today, and you're fervent in spirit, don't let things like this discourage you. People are trying to help. Keep the fire burning. Keep the fire kindled. We see an account here in Acts chapter 4, verse 20 of Peter and John. They were in the synagogue before the council and they were being commanded, don't talk about Jesus. Don't preach about Jesus anymore. And what, is, what was their response to this command? They said, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. See, can you imagine the things that Peter and John would have seen and heard? Do you think they would have been able to keep that on the inside and not share it with everyone else? Can you imagine if you got to see Jesus heal a man's blindness with your own eyes? If you got to see Jesus heal a paralytic with your own eyes, if you got to see Jesus raised from the dead with your own eyes, would you be able to keep that to yourself? Our response would be to never be quiet about it. We would want to tell everyone we came in contact with about the power of God and the things that we had seen and heard. You know, we have been healed. A miracle has been performed in our hearts. We have responded to the Gospel of Christ and we have been in contact with the powerful blood of Jesus Christ. Shouldn't that make us want to tell everyone we know about serving the Lord? That's a sign that we're on fire for the Lord. And we cannot let that fire go out. Because all too often we see this pattern in mankind. People grow cold. People get complacent. And the fire goes out. And we must work diligently to keep that from happening. Sometimes we're on fire... Sometimes we're passionate, but it can be all for the wrong reasons, can it? Paul addresses this issue in Romans chapter 10 when he was in context talking about Israel, about the Jews. And he says here in verse number 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. See, if you remember the context of Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, he's talking about the remnant of Israel. He's talking about a large majority of Israel that would not accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And so they have been cut off from that olive tree. They have been removed from the people of God. But there was still a remnant of the Jews that were saved. But he's writing here not to hate on the Jews... In fact, his hope is that they would be grafted back into that family. But he says here, my heart's desire and my prayer is that Israel may be saved, that they would have a, heal for, uh, that they would have a zeal for God according to the truth of God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Not according to their own knowledge, what they think they know, but according to God and the truth. And if they would have a zeal for the truth, they could be saved. They could be grafted back into that olive tree. You know, sometimes we can find ourselves a lot like Israel. And we're fervent in spirit. We're on fire. We're passionate about something. But that passion's not about God. 
I'll ask you tonight, what sets you on fire? What are you passionate about? Is it sports? I debated whether or not to put a, a Rangers logo up here, but I knew we had more Astros fans in the crowd today. I've been around people that all they can talk about is the game last night. All they can talk about is that one bad call that cost us the game. And then you know what happens? People get angry with each other over this stuff. People start arguing with each other. All you ever hear them talk about is baseball or basketball. That becomes their identity. That becomes everything about them. They think, sleep, and breathe sports. Is that your passion? Is it wrong to enjoy sports? No. But when that takes precedence over God, over serving the Lord, we've got our priorities wrong. Is it your career? Now, is it wrong to be passionate about your career? Is it wrong to be passionate about providing for your family? No. But sometimes we tend to get so caught up in work and in making money that we forget what's really important. Is that what sets you on fire? Politics. Every four years, this time of year, this is what everyone talks about. Red versus blue. People get angry with each other. All they can talk and think about is the next political issue and that, the next candidate in the upcoming election. I was in a customer's house yesterday. And I have serviced this customer for the past three and a half years. Every time I'm there, this is what he's talking about. I was there yesterday, and with this election coming up, you better believe he was talking. <laughs> I was in his house for about 20 minutes, and from the moment I walked into his doorway from, to the moment that I left his house, he was talking about some political issue. Let me tell you, I know nothing about this man, but I know everything about his political opinions. I can tell what he's passionate about because it's all he ever talks about. That is his identity. That's what he has a zeal for. And brethren, if we have a zeal and a passion for anything over passion for serving the Lord, then we need to reconsider what we're doing with our lives and who we're giving our hearts to. Because our identity is in Christ. And the fire that's in our hearts belongs as a living sacrifice unto our God. Now I want to talk about a few signs tonight that the Bible gives us that we might be on fire for the Lord. And these things that as we go through these, we need to examine ourselves. And we need to hope that they sound familiar and hope that, the, that we identify with some of the things on this list because they are signs that we might be on fire for the Lord. What does your prayer habit look like? Every single night, before I would go to bed growing up, mom and dad would come in my room and they would say, say your prayers before bed. And then they'd go through our memory verses and then they'd sing us a song. That was our nightly routine for years. Why do you think they were teaching me to pray every single night? To make that a habit. They were teaching me to be fervent in prayer. They were, teaching to me, they were teaching me that talking to our Creator is important. And it's something that we need to take seriously. James chapter 5, verse 16 says this, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. This is in the context of those who are spiritually sick. And he's saying that praying for those who are spiritually sick can have a great effect on those people but think about the way he describes this prayer. He says a fervent prayer. A boiling prayer. A prayer that's dripping with emotion. A prayer that's from the heart. Do you really mean the words you're saying when you pray to God? Are you going through the motions? Are you saying what, you're all, what you always say? Is your heart in it? We have a brother in Christ here, Brian Johnson. He is my favorite public prayer. When he gets up here and he says a prayer, he leads God's people in prayer. You can tell with every word that passes through his lips that he means it and that it's important to him. 
And if we are not like that, we need to consider where our heart is. Because our prayer life is important. And if you are fervent in prayer, that is a sign that you are on fire for the Lord. What about your study habit? Are you fervent in study? We talk about studying the Bible uh, pretty often and the importance of it, but we see examples of people taking delight in the law of the Lord. In fact, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, 22 says, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. The inward man talking about his heart. Deep to his core, he delighted in God's law. Do we delight in God's law? It's easy for us to say, yeah, I, I enjoy reading my Bible. I enjoy it. I, I do it from time to time. Let me ask you, do you scroll Facebook or TikTok more than you're on your Bible? And if our answer to that is yes, are we really fervent in the law of God? Are we fervent in our Bible studies? You see, how do we delight in the law of the Lord? You see, the first psalm gives us some insight as to how we delight in God's law. Verse number one, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the paths of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. When our delight is in God's law truly, it's going to be on our minds and on our hearts everywhere we go. When you're in bed at night, are you thinking about the Word of the Lord? When you're driving down the road, are you thinking about God's law? Are you thinking about those things that can help you grow spiritually as a Christian? That can help conform you closer to the image of Jesus Christ? Or are you thinking about how you can use those things to help other people and to teach other people? If God's law is not on our hearts and on our minds day and night, do we delight in God's law? If it is, that's a sign that our hearts are on fire for the Lord. What about your worship? Let me tell you, all week long, I have been encouraged by the worship. The songs we've been learning, the songs that we already know and have been singing, these are powerful songs. And they should be touching you to your core. They should mean something to you. What are we doing when we're coming together and singing these songs? We're worshiping God. We are singing these songs as a sacrifice of praise to our Creator. Do we pay attention to the words that we're singing? Do we pay attention to what those songs really mean? See, oftentimes we get caught up and distracted in things that we lose what it means to worship in spirit. You see, Jesus said in John chapter 4 to the Samaritan woman, He said in verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. In this passage, He gives us two items that hold the criteria of what worship ought to be. True worship acceptable to God. Yes, the truth is important. The truth is very important. We need to be worshiping God the way He asks to be worshipped. We need to follow the instructions of the Lord. But you know, worshiping in spirit is just as important. And sometimes, brethren, we can get so caught up and distracted by other things. We can get so caught up on one side of the coin that we forget there's another side. We'll come together and we'll sing a song. We'll sing praises to God, but we'll sing and we'll focus on making sure we hit that note just right. We'll make sure that we get the rhythm just right and then the song is over and we go, well, at least we didn't use instrumental music. And then we can't even say what the song we just sang was about. The fact of the matter is if we are not worshiping in spirit, that is from the heart with passion, if we're not worshiping in spirit, then we're not worshiping in truth. Because both sides of the coin are equally as important. And if you're here tonight and you find yourself singing, you sing along with Mario's There's a Stirring and he repeats the chorus seven times, and does that not build you up? That makes me boil. 
And if we can go through the motions singing that song and it doesn't bring a tear to our eye, it doesn't well up our emotions at all, is our hearts really on fire for the Lord? Everything you do. Colossians 3 and 23 says, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Everything you do in your life should be offered as a sacrifice to praise to God. We already established this in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. All the things we do ought to ultimately glorify God, ought to ultimately please God. Every decision we make in our lives. And this is talking about the, the, the passion that we have from the heart. He said, do it heartily. With everything inside of you. Not just because, not as you're doing it to the Lord. Some people read this verse and say, do this, just pretend you're doing it for the Lord. That's not what this means, because everything we're supposed to do should be a living sacrifice to God. We are doing everything unto the Lord. And finally, full of good works is a sign that we are on fire for serving the Lord. Let me talk to you about good works for a moment. There was a day a few months back that Landon called me up and he said, Hey, James, we've got a brother in Christ that he was in an accident and his, his back is not working the way it ought to. He's in pain, he's in need, and he needs his yard mowed. Can you come help me? Can we mow this man's yard? And me and Landon, Landon was fervent in spirit. Landon was zealous for good works. He wanted to do good works. He was on fire for the Lord. He wanted to help someone that was in need. And when I saw that, you know what happened? That encouraged me. And you know what happened to, with the man that we were helping? He was encouraged because of good works. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. I love this passage. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Who is this talking about? Who is the grace of God that brings salvation that has appeared to all men? That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has taught us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live righteously, hasn't He? Verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for good works. Who is His own special people? Well, those whom He has purified. Those whom he has, that He has cleansed with His blood. Brethren, that's you and me. We have been saved by the blood of Jesus. We are His people. And what are we supposed to be? Zealous, that is passionate for good works. Being full of good works is a sign that we are on fire for the Lord. Now, don't get me wrong, hypocrisy exists. And sometimes people can look good on the outside, but their hearts are full of dead men's bones. But generally speaking, you can tell where someone's heart is by their fruit. And we are supposed to be a people that is zealous, passionate, full of good works. And if we look back on our week or this last month, and we can count maybe one, two, three good works that we've done for our brethren, are we on fire for the Lord? Or in the past few weeks, have we been full of good works? Have we been zealous for good works? Because that's a sign that you're on fire. We ought to do some self-examination to make sure that we are on fire for the Lord. That our passion is in the right place. That we are giving our heart over to serving God. But let me tell you something about fire. Sometimes fire goes out. Sometimes fire grows cold. David, we read earlier about King David describing his heart being hot. Well, he describes the opposite feeling here in Psalms chapter 119 and 70. He's talking about Israel. He says, Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in your law. Israel was caught up in idolatry and sin and lawlessness, and their hearts were full of sin. 
And he describes their heart as being fat as grease. See, brethren, what happens is if we let our fire go out, our hearts slowly turn away from serving the Lord. And then eventually what happens, the end result is that we serve something else. And that is sin. We cannot let it get to this point. This is the end result. There's a process before we get to this end result. But this is what we have to look forward to if we are letting our hearts get cold for the Lord. Let's talk about that process for a moment. Turn to the book of Zephaniah. Give you a couple extra minutes because it's not every day we turn to the book of Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 12. God is speaking through His prophet. He says, And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish the men who are settled in complacency, the, who say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, nor will He do evil. He's talking about these people in Jerusalem. These people, these men who have settled in complacency, that is, comfortability. In their own lives, they have grown complacent. They are growing cold. And what do they say in their hearts? Are their hearts on fire? Are they serving the Lord? No, they say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will He do evil. What is He describing here? Indifference. He's describing apathy. And He says that these people who are settled in complacency, these people who have apathy setting into their hearts, God will punish. I heard, a, I heard Brother Sean Zebach one time say, actually this was a different brother, I'm, I'm, I'm getting my phrases mixed up, but I heard a brother say one time, when talking about the Great Commission and spreading the Gospel of Jesus Christ, he said, brethren, we do not suffer from ignorance, we suffer from apathy. And the point he was getting across was, we know what we need to do. We know what we need to do, we just don't care enough to do it. And oftentimes that is so true in our lives. We know that we're supposed to go out and preach Jesus. We know that we're supposed to be fervent in spirit, bringing people to Christ. But how many people do we pass up every single day without mentioning the name of Jesus? Not one time. That's when apathy sets in. That's when complacency sets in. And you know, when we first come up out of that water, we're fervent in spirit. We want to do everything we can to serve the Lord and to bring people to Jesus. That's what we're about. But then time goes by, and we relax a little. We grow a little colder, and the fire begins to go out, and then we become complacent. We become indifferent. We become indifferent towards these things, and things stop mattering toward, to us. You know what happens when this complacency settles into our hearts, when we begin to grow cold? Our hearts become numb. I don't know if you guys have ever worked outside in freezing temperatures before. I have done that only a couple times in my life. But let's say you're working on an engine or on your lawnmower or whatever it is, and you're outside and it's cold. What begins to happen to your fingers? They grow colder and, cr and colder and you begin to not be able to use them. You begin to not be able to feel them. Your fingers grow numb. And you lose feeling in your fingers the colder they get. As our hearts begin to grow colder and colder, and we grow deeper and deeper into complacency, and let apathy slowly creep into our lives, we will lose feeling. Our hearts will become numb. And then those feelings of joy that we have worshiping God together, the feelings of joy and passion that we have when someone gets up and preaches the Gospel, those things will stop moving us. Those things will stop meaning anything to us because we're going to lose feeling. They're not going to matter to us anymore. That's what happens. Eventually... We're, we're going to become so numb, we're going to lose all feelings in our hearts that the feelings of guilt and regret and shame are going to go away. And then temptation will come to us in our life 
And we're not going to have a conscience to tell us whether we should do that thing or not do that thing. And eventually, once we lose all feeling in our hearts, sin creeps in. Because once we turn our hearts away from the Lord, after this process of growing colder and colder, eventually we turn our hearts toward sin. And then eventually sin creeps into our lives and creeps into our hearts. And then we become just like those men at Jerusalem in Zephaniah chapter 1. And we begin to be like those people that David talked about in Psalm 119, where their heart was as fat as grease. Our hearts will be full of sin and it will take over our lives. And we've got to stop this problem before it gets to that point. Brethren, if you feel that you are starting to grow cold... We've got to fix the problem before it's too late. Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 1, says, Unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. This is Jesus speaking to the church at Sardis. And he says, I know your works, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember earlier we talked about a sign that you are on fire for the Lord is that you are full of good works? Well, Jesus Christ saw the works of these Christians. He says, I know your works. You see, they had a reputation for being alive, but Jesus Christ said, you are dead. Can you imagine hearing Jesus say that to you? I know your works. and You are dead. And he said, anything that remains, they're ready to die. That would not be a good feeling. That's what he said to the church at Sardis. Because eventually they grew cold. Eventually they grew complacent and they stopped with the good works. They were no longer alive, but they were dead. And we've got to stop this problem before we become dead in sin. You know, the church is made up of the hearts of the members. We are the church. And if our hearts have grown cold, that means the church has grown cold. And when we look at these front few pews right here, and we see them filled with the future of our church, the Lord's church, and we decide that our hearts are going to grow cold, and we let the church grow cold, do we care about the future of the church? What are we setting up for them? for them to have to repair, for them to have to deal with. We've got to not let the fires in our own hearts go out for serving the Lord because if that happens, the fire of our brothers and sisters will go out. The church is dependent on the hearts of its members, just like the hearts of our members are dependent on the church. And just like fire goes out, fire spreads. This is a picture of my dad. Growing up, we had a pretty good, pretty good sized backyard. And sometimes we would, pretty often, we would set pretty big fires out there. We would burn all the dead limbs in the yard. We'd burn the scrap wood and the dead leaves, and, and we'd burn it. I remember a couple times, though, that we would leave it unattended for just a couple minutes, and we'd go inside, and we'd get a drink, or we'd get a snack, or whatever, and... We'd come back outside two minutes later and a a quarter of the backyard is charred black. Set the yard on fire. Mom wasn't very happy, I'm sure. Fire spreads. That grass in the yard was fueling that fire to spread. And just like fire spreads, the zeal and the passion that we have in our hearts spreads to other people. Have you ever walked in this building and been encouraged? Have you ever been around a brother or sister in Christ that you could tell they were on fire for the Lord and that lifted you up? That built you up and that made you want to go serve the Lord? Look at 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia was ready a year ago and your zeal has stirred up the majority." the context that you see was writing to the church about their financial support. Their financial support to the church. And you know, he boasted about the zeal and the willingness that they had to give 
to be a giving people. And you know what that did to the other people? To the other churches, the other congregations? It stirred them up because their zeal spread. Their fire and their passion and their willingness to give spread to other places. And you know, God has blessed us with a very, very amazing blessing. God has blessed us with a support system and a group of people that we can go to and be encouraged. Where zeal and passion can spread. And it's how God designed it to work. Ephesians chapter 4 explains this design very clearly for us. Ephesians 4, starting in verse 11, And He Himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. This passion, this encouragement that we're talking about that we receive from our brethren, it's called here edification. This word edification means to be built up. You know, God's plan for His church is that every single member of that body, the body of Christ, would edify one another. Have you heard the term mutual edification? Oftentimes we use that phrase to describe us having a plurality of teachers. We don't just have one man that teaches the congregation. We have a plurality of teachers. But did you realize that we all have a responsibility to edify one another? Every single one of us. In fact, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, their responsibility was to equip the saints so that they could edify one another. And when we are edified, when we are truly encouraged by being with our family, with God's people, our fire will not go out. Because let me tell you, edification is the fuel that keeps the fire burning. And we can't risk losing this group of people. We can't risk leaving this group of people because what's going to happen is our heart's going to get cold and in a hurry. Because this is where the edification is at. This is where the fire is. This is where that fuel is that keeps your fire burning. You know what we see in the body of Christ? We see fervent love for one another. We see people who would give each other the shirts off their back. We have a support system that is there and designed by God to help you, to encourage you and to build you up, to keep that fire going. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 12, this is talking about miraculous gifts in this context, but if you'll allow me the liberty to teach a concept from this passage. He says in verse 12, Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Every single one of us has been blessed with a talent and an ability and a gift in some way. Whether that's preaching, public speaking, leading a song, maybe you're an encourager. You can use that gift to edify the church. And when that happens, when everyone does their part in the body, it causes growth in the body. Not only growth in numbers, but I believe this is growth in the spirit, in the hearts of the members that are there. That fire burns hotter and hotter. And if you're here tonight and you come to a worship assembly and you don't feel like you're being encouraged, you don't feel like you're being built up, you don't leave this place feeling like you're ready to serve the Lord, then something's wrong. And we need to examine our own hearts. 
Proverbs 18 and 1. We need to consider the words of this author here. He says, A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. Oftentimes we have people who obey the gospel and then they leave. They, don't, they think they can do this by themselves. They don't think they have to go to church every week. They leave and they think they can do it on their own. Well, if we isolate ourselves from the body of Christ, we are making a very foolish decision. Because I promise you, brethren, we can't do it on our own. Because our fires will go out. We are leaving the fuel that keeps our fire going. Here's the quote from Sean Zebok that y'all have all been eager about. I heard him say one time, the best chance you have at getting into heaven is to obey the gospel and to be active within a thriving church. Why do you think that's so true? Because we cannot do it on our own. We cannot isolate ourselves. Because the pattern is mankind, in mankind is that we grow fervent in spirit. We are on fire for the Lord. And then we grow cold. We have to be around the people who are going to keep us accountable, who are going to keep our fires burning. So as we consider our hearts tonight, and whether we are fervent in spirit for serving the Lord, I want you to take a look at this scale. We have hot, we have cold, and I want us to examine the temperature of our hearts. And in your mind, I want you to draw a mark on this scale wherever you think your heart is. And I'll do it with you. As we've talked about these things and signs that make you fervent in spirit, wanting to serve the Lord, and as you consider your life right here and right now, where are you on this scale? Has your heart grown cold? Are you on fire for the Lord? Look at Revelation chapter 3. Jesus writes to this church at Laodicea, verse 15, I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I could wish you were hot or cold, so then because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. If we are anything other than red hot, I heard a brother say one time, you make God sick. How does that make us feel? Is that acceptable? Is that pleasing to the Lord? Because the fact of the matter is, if we drew our mark anywhere on this scale other than where this arrow is pointing, it's high time that we make a change in our life. It's high time that we take a stand that we decide that we're going to serve the Lord. We're not going to grow cold. We're not going to turn to other things of this life, our own selfish passions. Because we want to go to heaven. Because we care about the church. We care about the Gospel. We care about our brothers and sisters in Christ. We care about the future and eternity of our souls. And if you're anywhere on the scale other than red hot, I beg you tonight, to change and give your hearts to the Lord. Because if we are lukewarm, we are unacceptable to God. If we are cold, sin has entered our hearts and has taken control and we've become fat as grease, we are unacceptable to God. The stakes are high. We've got to make sure that we are passionate about serving the Lord in all the things that we do every single day. And don't let that fire go out. I want to leave you with one final encouragement tonight. 2 Thessalonians verse three, uh, chapter 3, verse 13 says, But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Have you seen those Christians who are close to 80, 90, 95 years old, and they're still here, a part of the body of Christ, does that not amaze you? Does that not make you boil? You ever ask them how they do it? How do they not grow weary? 
Chase asked a question the other night. He said, how often do you think about heaven? And I can answer that honestly, and I can say I don't think about it enough. And I don't believe any one of us think about heaven enough. Because if we truly thought about heaven all the time in our everyday lives, and we thought about what it would be like to spend an eternity in comfort with our very Creator, and we get to be face to face with the One who paid for our ticket there with His blood on the cross, we wouldn't dare let our hearts grow cold. We wouldn't dare grow weary. Brethren, the future of the church is at stake if our hearts are cold. And the future of our eternity in heaven is at stake if our hearts have grown cold. And tonight, if you found yourself in that situation, it's time to recommit to God. It's time to let the church pray for you and to edify you and build you up so that you can make the decision to be on fire for the Lord. And as you take that first step into that aisle to come forward and have a front seat, Think about the future of your eternity. Think about what's at stake. Don't let another day go by where you are not on fire for serving the Lord.